Today is April 15th, 2013. We're at the Peabody Public Library with Jane Mullendor Oliver. We're here for the um, Whitley County Oral History Project. My name is Deb Lawrence, and we're glad to have you here today. Thanks so much, Deb. Glad to be here. So, are you a native Whitley Countyan? I am indeed born here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And where did you live in Whitley County? Starting at the beginning. Mm -hmm. My first and earliest memories, of course. Sure. <laughs> oh, very good. All right. Well, I was born at Whitley County Memorial Hospital. And, and it was on Oak Street at that point. On Oak Street, September of 1956. Very special building, no longer extant. So a little sad about that. Only can point to that space in the sky where I think I was born. <laughs> so, yes. So um, that was the beginning on Oak Street. Um, my parents lived just over the line in Noble County on Crooked Lake, one of the first houses um, on the north side of the lake, if you will. Um, and so I was there as an infant through second grade year round. Um, and then we came to town so that going to Whitley County Schools would be easier than Daddy driving me to school every morning on his way to the hospital because Daddy was the administrator of Whitley County Memorial Hospital. Oh, which makes it even neater that you were born there. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, Suppose Mom got special treatment? There were red roses. <laughs> <laughs> yes, with one yellow one, so she could never say that she had a dozen red roses, ah. which I find to be quite charming, but Daddy was that way. Uh, when the hospital was built, uh, my father was administrator, the first full-time administrator. There was an architectural administrator who was there for a few months just sorting out the details, making certain that everything was where it should be. And then from 1951 through um, the end of the 60s, my father was the administrator. So his name was on my birth certificate. And if you were born at the hospital between 1951 and about 1968 or 69, my daddy's name is on the hospital certificate. Mm -hmm. Not your legal one mm -hmm. from the city hall, but so. That's pretty cool. It is. So. Tears were shed when the new, but beautiful Parkview Hospital was built. More tears were shed when it was torn down. Yeah. So, life goes on. Yep. So then when you moved to Columbia City, where did you live? On Van Buren Street. My parents bought the Samuel Tremblay house. The Tremblays had built the house in the 1880s. And so when mom and daddy bought the house, on Van, West Van Buren Street, we were only the second family to live there. So, I guess you could say it was a new house, but it was steeped in tradition already. Um, Queen Anne style, three stories, huge, electric bill, probably <laughs> phenomenal today, <laughs> as I would think, and gas. Yeah. So, okay, so where did you go to school? Marshall Memorial. Wonderful. Um, it looks, if you were to travel and look at Marshall today, you can still see vestiges of where we kids were. You can still see the wonderful separate kindergarten building, which was reigned over supremely by Mrs. Sheehan. She was just phenomenal. She made you feel so special, but she corrected you. She wasn't afraid to be a grandmother figure but so supremely in charge, just lovely. Um, at the time, uh, there's so much that's different from the Marshall Eagle Tech Academy, mm -hmm. as they call it today. Um, you would stand on the front street, on Walnut Street, look at the school, and you still saw the old, original Columbia City High School. Yeah. Then there was the newer section, which was um, the, Marshall, the Marshall Auditorium. 
and then w we had um, the lower elementary section, two stories, and to the south, more behind the original high school building, mm -hmm. were the um, fourth grade and fifth grade rooms. So fourth grade on the top floor, they had to work to get there. Fifth grade, <laughs> because we were cooler, you know, we were down below. But um, first grade was in the old band rooms. There was a separate um, band. I guess music was too loud back in the <laughs> in the early days. I'm not sure, but there was a there was a wooden structure, which amounted to um, two classrooms. And both first grade rooms were held in that. It was behind where the kindergarten room, kindergarten building was. Mm -hmm. um, it almost makes you want to say, I did go to a one room schoolhouse, only it was just one grade. Right. So a one grade schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. um, it was clapboard, it was gray as I remember. And when the cafeteria was built on, it was taken down. But we, we were there, um, A through, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. <laughs> I have to stop thinking. A through L had Mrs. Parrish, and M through Z had Miss Stuckey. And it was just very, very cool. We had our own little building. We didn't realize how cool it was to be in our own little building. We would look fondly up toward oh, sure. second grade and third grade and say, you know, when we graduate from first grade, we get to go <laughs> to the brick building. <laughs> so that was great. And the tree that was always there, we didn't have bus drivers. We, we all walked. If we were on this mm -hmm. side of Main Street, we were at Marshall. The other boys and girls were at Mary Rayburn, which is just down the road from the library here. And we would walk to school in the morning and when it was lunchtime, we all walked back home because we didn't have a cafeteria. So it was a really big deal when the cafeteria came, but I still walked home for lunch because we lived right next to the school. <laughs> there was, I walked out our back door of our lovely home and I knew which picket on the picket fence moved and they were <laughs> wide and we could, and we were little, so we could slide that over and go shooting through the picket fence and go right into the school across the alley. So that was kind of fun. But eighth grade, I think um, I was finally one of the really cool kids that got to stay at school and eat. And eat lunch, yeah. But a lot, you know, a long lunch hour was great because you'd go home and mom would have, I don't know, vegetable soup and peanut butter mm -hmm. sandwiches and she'd ask you how your morning was and you'd tell her, you know, if you pass you know, Crayon 101, <laughs> <laughs> and um, do you get to be the milk person and go down into the basement and get the milk? Get the crate and bring it up. Yeah. Glass bottles, don't drop it. Right. But, yeah, so that was a lot of fun. Very cool. Do you have any other teachers from Marshall that stand out that were just, wow, they, they made a difference for you? Surely, yes. <laughs> And I would honestly say that my road to becoming an educator was very much um, influenced by those teachers. Kindergarten was Mrs. Sheehan, first grade Miss Stuckey, um, second grade Mary Catherine Youngblood, wonderful lady, fantastic. Uh, third grade Jeanette Bach, and saying their first name I might like to point out is so strange because they were only just misses. And I'm trying to think uh, if I even know what Miss Stuckey's given name is. Um, she was yeah, we never she was an imposing lady with great presence and lovely nurturing ways, but she was Miss Stuckey. Mm -hmm. Fourth grade was Karen Ketro. She went on to be um, one of the superintendents of Fort Wayne Community Schools. Wow. So, um, and um, <laughs> in fourth grade, we still enjoyed 
listening to teachers read stories. And I'm sorry if boys and girls today don't have that in place in the classroom. Things are certainly different, but um, I remember Mrs. Ketro reading um, Astrid, Astrid Ingren's Pippi Longstocking. Ah. And it was neat because Pippi had red hair and so did Mrs. Ketro. So, fifth grade was um, Mrs. Hayworth and she was, she was just great. Um, during her class, I was finally freed from the confines of, you must write in cursive like this always. She, let, she allowed me <laughs> <laughs> to develop my style of writing and become the, um, I don't know if I can be granted the title of calligrapher, but my handwriting is unique to many. And um, the arrangement we had was for penmanship class, I would agree to write the way the book showed. And everything else, she allowed me to use my own style. So, Neat. yeah, <laughs> I didn't have to slant my letters. I got to go straight up and down. And I didn't have to um, make the extra loop on my J. It could be just and my Y and Jane could go straight down, and I didn't have to loop it up. <laughs> you know, I thought that was wonderful. So, um, and then became then we became junior hires. As it happens at Marshall, the sixth graders were only Marshall kids on mm -hmm. the Main Street West side of town. Mary Raber was K through six. Mm -hmm. When seventh grade came, it was magic because all of a sudden, all of the kids that we didn't really know from Mary Raber came over and we were joined as the seventh graders. Mm -hmm. And we had seventh grade and eighth grade together. And it was divided 7A, 7B, um, 7C, 7D. And it really didn't, you weren't stereotyped if you were an A, B, C, or D. It didn't mean you were smart, better, no, smarter, yeah. slower, yeah. faster, anything like that. But um, our eighth grade class had 123 boys and girls in it. So when we were added as freshmen to all of the schools from the township schools, from Washington Union, Thorn Creek, Jefferson, Columbia, Etna Troy, um, we made up in Night, the fall of 1970, the largest class that they'd ever had. We were a booming baby boom class. So sure, sure. our entry number was over 300. When we graduated, we were a little under that to, I'm going to say authoritatively, 289. You can look it up. Go to the website. <laughs> <laughs> CCHS.com, whatever. Anyhow, so um, that was wonderful. Uh, we were when we went to junior high. We moved between the classrooms, and we were in the old high school building, the one that was always Columbia City mm -hmm. High School until 1959, when Columbia City Joint High School was born on Whitley Street. Um, so we were we were a smaller group. We were oh, let's say half the number. We were probably 30 in each of the mm -hmm. grade school classes, you know, two first, second, third, and so on. So there we were with the mighty seventh and eighth graders. And it was, it was really cool. We kept our heads down, clutched our notebooks, <laughs> and um, made it, we survived. <laughs> um, going between classes was just very traditional. If you were to watch the movie Hoosiers mm -hmm. and you watch Gene Hackman go in to be the coach at Hickory High School, uh, that building every time just it gives me a little <laughs> shiver just like I, as I'm talking now because our classrooms were, um, there's two full floors um, where our classes were, there was yet a third floor above, and the basement below had our home economics and shop classes. So um, when you would walk into the building, into the old high school, the rooms were on the 
on the four corners and the doors were on the diagonal. Okay. And um, mm, you'll have to ask me questions about that because I'm going to go on and on and just start describing yeah. the school. <laughs> but um, it was great. In sixth grade, our math teacher was Ronald Meyer, and he was he was cool. He was one of the first younger teachers that we had, and he was one of the first male teachers we had. We were exclusively um, taught by females. It was just traditional that elementary students right. had elementary or, or female teachers. And so at the junior high level, Ron Meyer, Roy Kilby for health, and uh, I remember that he also taught English for sixth graders. Um, he, was, he was really neat. And um, Norman Good taught science at the school at Marshall back. Um, I'm going to say we were 1969, 67 through 70 as junior hires. Mm -hmm. I think that works out, 68, yes. Right. <laughs> Yay. Fall of 67, hurrah, I've got that right. Um, we had a science teacher, Mr. Wygant. Um, there was some movement within the teaching ranks. Teachers would often come in as young teachers, um, get their feet wet at junior high level, and because of their licensure, move then on to another position at the high school here in town. Mm -hmm. or they may just move. It's not wrong to say that teachers sometimes have itinerant lives where they're, they're moving from place to place. There were those who'd been there forever. And Mary Jane Lesh had taught at the high school, or I'm sorry, junior high for years and years, and she was our seventh grade English language arts teacher. We made a small move into language arts away from English. And it just sounded so mysterious, I'm sure, to my parents as well, because they had English, not language arts. Right. She was an older lady. I will not say that I know how old she was then. I know that she did live to be something amazing, like 96 years old. Wow. So if we trace back in time, she may have only been in her 50s, but she had gray hair. It's lovely, isn't it? <laughs> and... <laughs> So, um, but she was, she was very, she seemed quite tall, and she was very slender, and she was definitely, yes, Miss Lash, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. She just, she just cultivated that mm -hmm. out of you, and there we sat in the same wooden desks that were there when it was a high school. So think, um, and they might have been made at Peabody Works in North Manchester. Um, I could look that up for you. <laughs> <laughs> but they were, they were hooked together, and um, there were three rows of these wooden desks with the tilting seats, and um, my father had sat there when he attended and, and graduated wow. in 1931, so it was really very special and I will confess that at some point I think I might have looked down at the wood and had a pencil in my hand and and doodled into the top <laughs> of the desk in that room and the initials J and M were right there on top of that desk. Um, Dale Pence was our principal <laughs> followed by Richard Welker. Um, when it was time for the school to be renovated and the old high schools to be torn down, when Marshall was still um, one of the city elementary <laughs> junior high schools, um, I went to Mr. Pence, I believe, it may have been Mr. Welker, and asked what, what's to become of these desks, and he said, well, we really don't have any plans for them. Is there a reason that you want to know? And I said, well, there's a desk in Miss Lesh's classroom that I would really love to have. And because they weren't planning to keep them or do anything other than just dispose of them, um, 
we went up and we got my desk and I have that very desk oh, at how home. Neat. Yes, with my That's initials. Very in. cool. So <laughs> Yeah. So then what was it like? You know, schools in Fort Wayne, they grow up in the neighborhood, they stay in the neighborhood, they go to that neighborhood school. Mm -hmm. With Columbia City Joint High School, you had every freshman in Whitley County mm -hmm. at one school. What, what, what was that like? We thought it was wonderful. Um, we did have the township, township schools in place. Not all of our townships in Whitley County were through the high school years. There were some schools which did not graduate through 12th grade. They stopped at 8th grade. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those outlying area students, if they wanted to go on because it wasn't always expected, they would move to a different county, or sorry, different township and finish there. Or they would come into Columbia City High School and finish. Mm -hmm. um, I was fairly young, thank you. When that decision was made in 1959, I was only three. So um, I didn't really know about the high school in the town. I, I knew mm -hmm. of it. But that wasn't something that in my mind, for me, I went to school in Columbia City and I graduated in Columbia City. Right. The township kids came in to town. That must have seemed lots different to them but for us having only been the city kids and then having the township kids come in it was so neat because all of a sudden we have all of these people that we haven't known all of our lives to get to know and if I were to say the old ways really did work I probably would sound a lot like the older people several generations back who said well it really worked when it was Township high mm -hmm. schools. Um, it was it was a lot of fun. Are we good? Yeah, I'm just checking time. <laughs> it was really good. Um, it was something new. It was um, a chance for new friendships to be created. You weren't together in your little pods, if you will. When we went to the high school. We were mixed up with all of these new kids, starting with summer school, mm -hmm. because you could take biology and then have a free spot on your schedule, and that was <laughs> neat. And it it was just a lot of fun. It was great. Um, I wish the boys and girls in Whitley County could, ex in our school system, could experience that today. The fun of going in and all of a sudden, you know, you're the low man on the totem pole, and you just sort of, that makes you sort of stay together. Um, yeah. <laughs> survival. Um, you had to not worry about the big kids, but you kind of looked forward to being teased by a senior because then that was cool. They knew you existed. Yeah, yeah. at least you were a person. Yeah, yeah you, were, yeah. you yeah. were a person. And um, it was just, it was great fun. And the way that we went from having at... Marshall Memorial in junior high, six classes a day with a, a yawning lunch period in the middle. Mm -hmm. We went to mods. We were so cool and so ahead of the time. <laughs> we had 14 classes available a day, 30 minute increments, and the schedule was so flexible. And it's all we ever knew as high schoolers. And it was great. And when I went back to the high school as a teacher and it was back into the regimented six or seven periods a day, I found myself looking at the clock on my wall of my classroom thinking, but if it were mods, we could do two today, one tomorrow, and there would be flexibility and large group lecture. Yeah. And yeah, large group isn't even there anymore. No. It's or the tennis courts. Or no, which were right outside of my classroom when I taught there. Yes, we could watch activity. It's also different. It is different. But the only thing that stays the same is change. That's true. Very true. So when you went to CCJHS, mm -hmm. 
I always throw that in there because that's where I went too. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> who, who were some teachers that stood out in your mind at that point? Oh, great. That's a very great question. Um, I think I could name them all. I honestly do. We had some really great teachers. We they were, were awesome. awesome. They were very committed. Um, many of those teachers had moved from other um, from other schools where they had taught at, say, Coesi High School. Right. Bill Wilder taught um, agriculture at Coesi, and he moved on to teach at the high school and make a great impact on everyone who took horticulture and um, and was involved with the FFA program. Um, and teaching for over 45 years is just incredible. It makes you just say, wow, that is such commitment. And, and most of the teachers there are, <coughs> I know when my kids went to the high school and they came home and they go, I got this teacher. And I'm like, really? They're still there. How Oops. cool is that? Yeah, you know? <laughs> exactly. Um, Leon Alter was an incredible name. As, as a freshman, uh, we wouldn't always have, and I'm sure you remember, we wouldn't have some of the higher class level teachers, the, those who taught juniors and seniors. We, we, would ha we would have been in that, because there's always a turnover of teachers retiring, um, we would have been in the building with them and know them, and if we were brave enough, you know, talk with them, mm -hmm. which was never a large problem for me even as a freshman, <laughs> but um, teachers that I wasn't able to have, that I wish I would have had, would have been um, Leon Alter, who only recently passed away at age 100 and yeah. something incredible. Yeah, I think he was 102. Uh, Udolph Holy Cross, whom everyone called Doc, though he was not <laughs> a Doc of any variety. Um, was a staple entity, you know, in the history department. Um, I'm going to say that, with the exception of, wow, mm. I'm trying to think if there was anyone there whom I could say taught when my father was there. Oh. And that's that's just too large a gap. Yeah. That would have been virtually 40 years, and unless it was someone who... Yeah, I'm trying to think. No, I, I can't think of anyone. Um, Ford Fleck taught in the science. Mm, yeah. And Joe Shaw, and they had retired a few years before I got there, but um, back to the to the question of who were the, the teachers that really stood out. I'm going to assume that you want to discuss teachers from freshman year through senior year? Sure. Okay. Um, my hat's off to all that Keith Janagi, our band director, taught us. I'm going to champion his amazing um, ability first. Um, he was there being uh, a very, very, for, for the late 60s, early 70s, and all that the youth of America was attempting to go through. Uh, we, were, we were turbulent children. Not that you or I were part of that ilk. <laughs> we were very good. Um, but he was, he was a very, very strict gentleman. And I can't believe when I count back, he is still living as we speak today in April of 2013. Um, he is in his late 90s and um, could probably still play a saxophone if you put it in his hand. I mean, much of what he remembers is the past and not the present in his senior years. But um, he was... <laughs> He was younger than I am as I'm sitting here, and yet he seemed he seemed so much 
older, his background was uh, the Marine Corps bands and during World War II, and he brought that to our band. We were a military-style marching band. We were, um, oh my gracious, we were knees up straight with, you know, legs were brought up into sharp position and our toes pointed at the ground. If you didn't have your feet high enough off the ground, you couldn't point your toes. And we were awesome and we won awards with Nisbova, the, the school and band organization. And we marched and we wore wool uniforms. And, and there yes, were a lot of you. It was a much bigger band than yes. they have now. Our band, our freshman year, our marching band was over 100 and 20 individuals. It was it was a strong program. You you went through school, you went through grade school, looking forward to being part of the high school band, and out onto the field you went with your. They had better be pure white band pants. I mean your uniform pants were white with stripes, and if you weren't marching all together with the same leg at the same time, it stuck out. So. Um, Mr. Janegi's band was wonderful, and what he did um, with us was amazing. And thank you, Mr. G. You were great. Um, in junior high, our choir director was this wonderful young fellow who was extremely cool and cutting edge, I think. <laughs> Sheldon Bixler, who went on to be the high school's choir director. Um, he, was actually, he was actually choir director at the high school and it was his job, responsibility, to drive over to Marshall on Tuesdays and Thursday mornings. And at 7 a.m. we were doing our vocal warm-ups and wow. we were singing. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, just, oh my, so many wonderful teachers. Ruth Spooler whom students today, recent students, would have known as Mrs. Elena Meyer mm -hmm. um, because she was remarried. But she started as a um, new teacher at Marshall and inspired us. Um, she taught all of us. We marched down to her room and from the elementary section and she taught us in um, sixth grade, fifth grade and sixth grade. Um, and then she had the audacity to accept the teaching position <laughs> at the high school. And I'm so glad she did because four years of having Ruth Spooler as an art teacher was really so cool. Um, she brought so much that wasn't being done to the high school in the art program. We had the largest gas kiln, that which you do your pottery in. Um, in the state of Indiana outside of um, a college kill. Um, she had us doing silver casting. Anytime that we were going to use the centrifuge to do the silver casting with using lost wax process, um, the call would go out, everybody down, because you never knew if it could possibly fly out of there. And, um, you know, it was quite, it was quite a thing. It was <laughs> not good to have hot silver getting all over you. So, so, you know, we all ducked when that went out. We did silk screening. We had batik. We were taught to do not only hand-built pottery, but thrown pottery on wheels, electric and kick wheels. It was awesome to be in spoolers and we called her Spooler. I mean, that's what she wanted. She was young, and that's, and it was respectful. We didn't mm -hmm. call her by her first name, but um, to be in Spooler's room was to be given a gift because um, she was a very, she was a very um, demanding teacher. If she told you, oh, that's cute, you knew that you'd totally blown the assignment mm -hmm. because cute wasn't where you were supposed to be going with your artwork. And she taught us to do watercolors and acrylics. And, um, <laughs> gee, you, 
G-A-U-C-H-E, guachi, um, <laughs> which often looked like gaucho to me, but yeah, <laughs> but there was, she offered so much and it was cool. You'd want to eat your lunch there just so you could do your art classes. Um, the language, the language department of the high school when we were students was wonderful. Lois Walters taught, uh, Miss Walters taught Latin. Unfortunately, she decided that when she was in her 70s, it was time to retire. And with the retirement of Lois Walters was a retirement of the Latin program at the high school. Yeah. How sad is that? Um, we were cool because we had Bob Fall teaching Spanish and German. So to have a German class was mm -hmm. extremely cool. But pour moi, it was French with Susan McLaughlin. And Miss McLaughlin was very cool. She invited us to her home and we cooked beef bourguignon. And I'm sure it was Julia Child's recipe. <laughs> but we were, it was so cool just to do things like that. Uh, every department had individuals as I remember them. Um, and I could see walking past the individual departments and seeing the history department with you know, the sage and wise Mr. Barry. Oh, to get to Mr. Barry's class and have U.S. history where it came absolutely alive to get to government class with Jim Thompson. It was so cool. And I would like to backtrack just a skosh and say that at junior high level, uh, David Heinbaugh was our social studies teacher for sixth grade and seventh grade. And it was in his class that I learned to take notes. Only in my young and adolescent impression of what notes were, it meant taking every single word <laughs> down that he ever said. I can get out my sixth and seventh grade notebooks for social studies, and I can tell you exactly what the man said because I actually learned to write as quickly as he spoke. Oh my. <laughs> yes. Um, eighth grade was Margot Langauer, and history was just fabulous with Mrs. Langauer. She was so cool, and she brought her art skills mm -hmm. into it. So one of our projects in eighth grade was to letter um, two, two of us girls, we, for our classroom bulletin board, we did on craft paper the Declaration of Independence, the oh. preamble. Uh, Okay, that's two different things. Let's be more specific. It was a preamp. It was a Declaration of Independence. I'm going to stay with that. That's my main <laughs> answer. Okay. All right. So she showed us how we could roll it up on either end and make it look like it was a scrolled document. It was not on vellum. It, it was on brown paper, bag type paper. But she took us outside with a lighter and we had a wet towel and we burnt the edges of it so it looked real. And then it was rolled up <laughs> and when it was all said and done, it went home to my house. And I honestly think my mother had it hanging above our piano for way longer than it needed to be. But she thought it was neat because it was lettered with India ink and my knuckle was black from dipping into the ink with the pen and the nib. Um, and then the other teacher that I glossed over, I didn't even get to him, at junior high level, level was Dennis Parr. And he was absolutely the epitome of cool. All of the other male teachers wore suits with narrow lapels and pencil ties. Mm -hmm. Mr. Parr walked in and it was like <sighs> the Beatles had arrived. He was so cool. <laughs> His blonde hair kind of swooped down. It wasn't greased back with real cream. Mm. He wore suits with wide collars and a wide tie. And oh my gosh, every girl in eighth grade English class had a crush <laughs> on him. He drove a Volkswagen Beetle. It was not a sedan. <laughs> he was so cool. And he, he was very gifted. Definitely, definitely was the individual who started my love of, of the English language and using it as an English educator. Um, he critiqued my writing and helped me understand 
that I was really good and I could really do something with this. And he yeah. went over to teach, um, I think, from Marshall straight to Homestead High School and taught there for 30 years and recently retired from Homestead. Wow. So, very cool. At the high school, in English class, I can't not say that Laurel Style, Mrs. Style was just exactly the right person to take me through my high school years of English and show me that it was going to absolutely be a place that I would want to go. And when I came back to teach, she was there still, and she was my department chair, along with everyone's favorite freshman English teacher in the universe, the late Bob Britton. And I'll start crying if I talk a lot about him. Okay, we won't do he's, that. He's, he's, gone to, he's gone too soon. Yeah. We loved him so much, and I'm so glad that the library has an auditorium named in his honor. Cool. Yes. Okay, let's, let's skip back in time a minute. Okay. When you were in grade school and, and in middle school, what did you do after school? After school? Well, it wasn't running home to get on the computer. Um, as far as we knew, computers were things that helped shoot rockets into space. And big as this room. Yes. <laughs> and or larger. Yes. Um, after school, uh, we were expected to go home and do any homework that wasn't finished in, in school. Um, as I remember, first grade, second grade, third grade, we were expected to do our work in our classroom. And we turned it in when we finished it. And it was the day's assignments there. We might have a book report that we had to read our book at home, of course. Starting in fourth grade, there were there were more things to go home, essays to write, um, book reports that needed to be a little more um, substantial, not just one page. Mm -hmm. um, so when that was finished, um, there were a few favorite television programs that we might watch, but going to a friend's house was always wonderful. And when you lived in town, the luxury was there to just walk a block or so to your best friend's house. So during grade school years, you could count on Lee Ellen Strauss and I being together <laughs> <laughs> almost 24 seven. That was great fun. Um, you, you knew best your classmates in your individual classroom. It was sort of um, a different world. The, the M through Z classroom didn't play with the A through Lers. It just, and we, and we, I don't know why they didn't mix us up. And I don't know if, we always thought we were the best part of the alphabet. <laughs> I'm sure we were. <laughs> I love you, A to L, but, but we were always together. So um, when, we, when we became sixth graders, then we, we intermingled. We, we, um, our classes were not just mm -hmm. according to the alphabet. Um, we, would, we would get together and um, we would have running races. I mean, this sounds just so, it, it wouldn't happen today. No. I'm, I'm just kind of going, wow. And it was when I would run with um, you know, when we'd have these little neighborhood track meets that all of a sudden they were noticing that, oh, she's beating the boys. <laughs> well, what did we do about that? Well, if you look at the Columbia City Joint High School yearbook, the Columbian, in 1971, and you turn to the sports section, you will find standing on the back row, individuals, uh, let's do it this way, here we go, and then all of a sudden it kind of drops down. Well, that drop down on the back row was me because we didn't have girls track. We didn't have girls sports of any kind. So I was good enough, I was on the boys track team. <laughs> cool. Much tinier, much younger. <laughs> I was fast though. 
<laughs> so, okay, that takes care of after school. So on the weekends, did you like go uptown? Walking to Schultz's Dime Store or Roffers was a great, great treat. And there was a, there was a candy counter and nut selling lady at Schultz's and it was just great fun to have your allowance, 25 cents, was not an uncommon weekly allowance. Right. You know, you'd save up four quarters, trade it into daddy for a dollar and put that, you know, it was really special. But having a little pocket change, going down and asking for 10 cents worth of salted peanuts or if you were really, really feeling special to get a little bag of warm cashews. It was just great. So thinking about downtown, uh, yeah. what's, what's not there anymore? Oh, wow. So much. I will walk with you downtown from my house on Van Buren Street. As you were approaching downtown, one of the, one of the, in as much as Van Buren Street used to be the main through right. thoroughfare, right. it was it was essentially old thirty old Lincoln Way mm -hmm. through town. We didn't have the new highway until the '60s, and I remember when that was built and we drove on a little patch of it. It was just amazing. <laughs> but there were there were gas stations on the corners. So at the intersection of West Van Buren Street and Walnut Street, the Marathon Station is where there is now um, an empty beauty salon. It, the Marathon mm -hmm. Station on the northwest corner is gone, and that seems so strange. Across the street immediately east of it was Fisher's Gas Station, where you, later on when... Um, Dale, let's see, they went from Fisher's to the Gay family. They had, and it may have been there, I'm sure it was there for Fisher's. It was a little bit of a few groceries, but there was an ice cream chest. And there was the most amazing, oh my gracious, amazing fudge ripple ice cream. <laughs> and to have Mr. Gay wash his hands and go get an ice cream cone for you and scoop up fresh hard ice cream. I'm going to go get some ice cream. That would be great, Deb. <laughs> yeah, let's go. <laughs> that sounds so good. That was, that was a great treat. On, on Thursday evenings, my daddy would walk my little brother and I down to Fisher's or um, Dale Gay's, mm -hmm. and we would get ice cream while Mommy was at her bowling league because both of my parents were very athletic and sports oriented, um, golfing in the summer, bowling in the winter, when, when league was very proper and you wore a certain shirt mm -hmm. and it was all, but that was the great treat, supper and then walking down for ice cream. I miss, I miss that that's not an ice cream place even today, <laughs> you know, 45 years later. Um, immediately north of the Marathon Station was another gas station, but it had been converted into something called Stop and Go. It was just that little corner convenience store, and they had the best selection of gumballs in the universe. And my mom and daddy, mommy especially, would say, you've been to Stop and Go. I can smell grape bubble gum. <laughs> oh yeah, grape bubble gum. Oh my gracious. Um, on the northeast corner, the building still stands. The, the uh, congregation is non extant, but it was um, the Baptist Church. Um, and now we're we're going to walk on the north side of the road. That was the side that was the side of the street that our home was on. So we're walking on the north side of Van Buren Street. Um, there was a laundromat, and you could look in and see people busy, busy, busy doing all of their folding and clothes, you know, for the week. Um, we crossed the alley and there was Cleland's Restaurant. And that was a great little family-owned restaurant. Next to it was Frank Bauer's Barbershop, where my brother 
would have to sit every Saturday getting his hair cut. <laughs> it was so good that he had to sit still once in a while. Love you, Jeff. <laughs> but the cool thing was, every time that he sat still, he got to get into the little drawer where Mr. Bauer kept all different kinds of sticks of gum. So he got a reward. I didn't get my hair cut, so I didn't get any. <laughs> uh, what I remember about Bauer's Barbershop, he had chairs that a lot of people would call, um, I think, Kennedy chairs. They were huge wooden armchairs, high back, Definitely came before President Kennedy, but apparently Mr. Kennedy, President Kennedy, had a chair like that in his office, or a, a chair like that that was a rock, a rocker a mm, desk chair. Yeah, yeah. So big white armchairs that the men would sit, you know, along the the west or east wall. Um, next to the barber shop was Miller's Music Store where anyone who was going to become an Andy Bander would go for their instrument, for lessons. Um, you could buy sheet music there. I looked at an album in the used album section and I can still see myself doing it to this day. It was the Beatles' original album and it was there for like a dollar. And I thought, oh, that's cool. But I wanted to buy 45s because, <laughs> you know, it was modern, and to this day I'm thinking, oh, I wish I had that original Beatles album, but yeah. I didn't. It was like, meet the Beatles, okay. So, um, as you walked on down um, Van Buren on that block, the next thing you would see was, um, well, it was, I believe, the original Squires' Jewelers. Um, it was a jewelry store on the corner. We were in what was in the Grant Building. Mm -hmm. So if you went north on Lime Street, um, Grant's dental office was there, Lowell and Walt Grant. And um, that building um, left our city in 1976 in the winter with a horrific fire. And... Um, you know, you just, you miss those buildings of childhood. Yeah. So, um, across the street in that same block would have been um, Thompson's original car um, sales, where Redmond's Plumbing and Heating mm -hmm. have been for years and years. Thompson's then went and moved um, east of town on 30. It's now City Motors. Yeah. And even that's a lot changed. Um, the furniture store is still there, but when you cross the street, uh, and the furniture store was on the corner, it was McLean and Omspaz, and then it became later Gregor, McGregor Furniture. But when you cross the street, on the same side of the street, south side, um, but now you've crossed Line Street, there was the first grocery store that you would have come to, and it was Jan's Brothers Grocery. And walking into that grocery, was amazing. As a little girl, I would walk with my grandmother from their house on South Elm Street. She would have a little cart that she would pull behind her, um, three or four paper bags of groceries would be put into the grocery cart and then we'd walk back home because grandma never drove. And going into Yance's was amazing. It was wooden floored, bananas were brought in in crates and so there the bananas were in excelsior packing just right there where you could you know choose your bananas the meat counter was there where they cut their meat it was just a great little grocery store and i never remember my grandmother ever buying more than um five dollars worth of groceries a week but it would be several sacks full yeah. <laughs> Just amazing. Across the street on the north side was Roffer's store. Um, I guess they were called a dime store. Yeah, kind of, probably, sort of. Yeah. It was Ro Roffer's Five and Dime. Mm -hmm. and only they were a very. It was a very special store. Um, they not only had their candy counter, but if you walked clear to the back of the store, they had 
a whole room full of all the toys that you would ever want to have. <laughs> you would um, walk down a set of stairs and find all of the, the um, household goods and their gift wrap section was underneath that stairway. They had a machine that made bows and I thought that was fascinating to watch this pretty blonde haired lady make bows and then the final little tack was put through all of these ornately folded elbowed loops and you'd have this pretty bow and it would go on to the package and she would say how what do you think and of course usually it was when daddy and I would go to get something for mommy special and we'd have it wrapped the most amazing thing was that pretty blonde-haired lady ended up being my mother-in-law all those years <laughs> later I didn't know that she was Mrs. Oliver Beverly Oliver um, just the pretty lady who made bows underneath the stairway when, How neat when is that? you needed to have it. So yeah, now that's that's kind of way cool. Walking on down that corridor, if you will, of activity because there was always so many people. It was it was bustling with people coming to town to shop. And the next thing you came to was Blumenthal's um, clothing store where ladies bought hats and, and dresses and there was a children's section and it was just wonderful. It was, you know, an old steeped in tradition store. You walked in and they had ceiling fans which with the electric fluorescent lights above it, the, the room sort of did this. Strobed a little Strobed bit. A little bit. <laughs> and I, I would never look up very long as a child because it was just <laughs> too much for me. But um, Blumenthal's was a great store. It was the kind of store where Grandma would go for um, what she needed to wear. It was um, very traditional. Um, the next building would have been the Gates Family's Farmers Loan and Trust Bank. But the thing that I remember most about that section would be um, when Daddy and I would be having lunch, because Daddy was the administrator at the, at the hospital, mm -hmm. I would walk and we were paying tuition for me to come to school from Noble County. We mm -hmm. didn't have a house to mm -hmm. go to. So I would walk from Marshall Memorial down Jolly Street or whatever I guess it's, it's jolly that the, the, the angle. Time, yeah. Yes. I didn't know if it turned into Park Street at that point, but I think it was Jolly Street, down to Oak Street, all the way up to the hospital. And then Daddy and I would either go to Cleland's restaurant for dinner or we would go to Kaiser's restaurant, which is where um, the new restaurant on the east side of the courthouse on the square, downtown, oh, on the yeah, square yeah. is. Okay, um, and there would be other things that Daddy would need to do in the course of that lunch period. Maybe he would need to go to the post office to pick up the mail for um, the hospital out of the big drawer. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a great place for Daddy to put his fingers in his mm -hmm. mouth and whistle, and it would just, it was such an incredibly loud whistle and it would just echo <laughs> and I would say daddy we're at the spot you have to do it and he would look and of course part of it was the pride that his little girl was asking him to whistle in town and he would and of course there were so many people and they would turn and look and they would see I don't know if I got that privilege every time we walked down the street but um, I never failed to think of that when I walked past the new um, City County building yeah. that we have. Um, across the street then, in my mind's eye, I see the garden gift shop where Kathy Herder's Bravo um, Baskins mm -hmm. store is. Um, that was a great place. It would be open on Sunday after church for, um, in my very younger years, for just a small window of time and you were able to get a Sunday paper there. And I thought that was so cool to get to go 
shopping on Sunday because virtually all stores Everything. were. Yeah. It was always it was a custom. It was a family day. It was a day of worship, and the city woke up, got dressed, went to church, and maybe picked up a newspaper, but you know that was the day that you spent with your family. Okay, so we're still walking along Van Buren Street in the early 1960s, I would say, is where we are. Mm -hmm. um, next to, um, adjacent to the garden gift shop on the corner, uh, not corner, but on the alley, would have been um, Max and Betty Reed's shoe store. And that building has a lot of history and tradition in it. Um, and I, I hesitate to make anyone aware of the fact that we weren't always as um, kind and Polished. tolerant and <laughs> loving as always. And you may anticipate already where I'm going, but um, the stories are true. Um, the back end, not during Max and Betty's years, but long before, the back end of the shoe store was actually the meeting room for the Ku Klux Klan in Willie County. And I remember going into the back room and having Mr. Reed explain that um, he was told, now here were where uh, the sheet gowns were and hoods were held. And it's just, to me, so astonishing to think that um, we were ever so so frightened to be so narrow-minded against our fellow man. Well, Dean Agner gave me a whole book on the Whitley County Ku Klux Klan. It's in our Indiana room. It's quite eye-opening. It is. <laughs> it's, it's astonishing. It is to know that that was such an important part of so many families' lives. And every once in a while there's still someone who's old enough that um, they tend to still have those feelings deep within them, and they talk about it, and they still believe in it. And I would just like to say, that's really too bad. You're missing out on a lot of great experiences with other parts of the world. Yeah. Hmm. All right, we're going to go back to the north side of Van Buren Street, and we are on the 200 block. So, of course, every child's favorite spot had to be Schultz's yeah. Dime Store. And, you know, that was, that was just a great place. And my mind's eye sees Mr. Um, Mr. Goss mm -hmm. as the kindest, nicest store manager that a child could ever meet. Um, you walked in and he would often be in the little office that was above um, the doors to the west um, as you walked in and you could look up and say, hello, Mr. Goss, and he knew your name and he would say, hello, how are you? And of course you went by the candy counter or the, um, the peanut side and maybe get a treat there. Um, you knew where the toys were you knew where the china horses were. It was a remarkable uh, business. It was, um, I don't know the history of, the, of Schultz's dime store, but it rivaled things like Belmont's dime store in Fort Wayne and relation who lived in Allen County, um, their older, the grandparents would say they would much rather come over to Schultz's Dime Store because it just had everything and anything you wanted. <laughs> and every once in a while I'll find just a little something that I purchased as a child or a young bride and it still has the Schultz's sticker. Red, red writing. And it was right <laughs> there and you just kind of go, oh, save that memory. Um, it, it is a good thing to keep little bits of ephemera, mm. paper things that help you retrieve those memories. Oh, yeah. So, so Schultz's was there, and next to Schultz's was um, the original. Um, well, I won't say original, original, but yes, I think it was the original location for the Kroger store in Columbia mm -hmm. City. Um, 
I don't know of it being any place else, but Kroger's was there. And then following Kroger's, when they moved to their huge building north of town. At, but they moved over to where Aldi's is now. First. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's where I'm going. Yes, they were um, at the end of North Line Street mm -hmm. when we got our first shopping center. Wow, it was so cool. But um, after... After Kroger's was Key Pharmacy, and they also had LP records and 45s, and they sold wonderful perfumes like Love's Lemon Fresh, and they had, you know, a perfume counter, and it was very cool. But if you walk to the back of the store, back next to the um, the pharmacy, on the north end of that store, they had a veterinary supplies and that was just kind of cool I mean because you know I ended up buying some things for my horses there and what kind of drugstore do you go into today and there's yeah you know wheat germ oil <laughs> for your horses or whatever but um, and that was a, a building that had a front and rear entrance and you could go out the back of the store and that was cool because that saved you so many steps. Not really, but you know, you could you could save walking down to the corner and then down the street to the post office. You could go right out the back door, um, and next to Key Pharmacy, another wonderful building that we lost was the Strauss Building, mm -hmm. where Strauss's Menswear had reigned supreme as the men's store of town for ever. Yeah, on the north. <laughs> on the northwest corner, and um, that was another store that you could walk out the back or come in from the back and, and say hello to the most wonderful, wonderful <laughs> man, Bud Strauss, who is always Mr. Strauss to me, and we miss him dearly, but he and his uncle ran that store for years, and um, you know, in my mind's eye, seeing the hardwood floor and the suit the suit cases, meaning the wardrobes mm -hmm. with the glass doors that were opened and summarily the rack of men's suits pulled out and daddy would get a new suit or a new top coat. Across the street, relation of the Strausses was Flox Department Store. Well, a relation worked there. But our wonderful, um, hmm, a, a wonderful department store. Oh, yeah. Uh, they sold dry goods. You could buy fabric. And That's where I got all my embroidery floss. Yes. <laughs> you could go there easily. Um, on the opposite end of that block, when Yance's retired, the Fabric Center came in with Ned and Alma Freeman, and they had just the most amazing amounts of fabric and everything. Um, but Flox has always had just what you, just what you needed, the, the thread, the zippers, the simplicity, simplicity or, or McCall's patterns. Um, they didn't mess around with Vogue. That was down at Mr. and Mrs. Freeman's <laughs> shop. But, um, and they had, uh, on, a, on the back end of the building, um, the men's department, so, you know, Dad could... If he didn't find what he wanted at Strauss's, he could check to see what Dick Flox had at his store. Um, there was a full shoe, um, a full shoe assortment, really catering to younger children. You could get your PF Flyer sneakers and rubber boots and rubber boots for school. <laughs> oh yeah! And Danny Daniel was just the man, and you loved to have him check your shoes because he'd always you know, put in a good word if he saw that you really liked this pair of sneakers the best. He would help you at least plead the case with mom and dad. Um, next to Flox's, going back west, would have been um, a long, long time ago, Mullendorf's Confectionery, a relation of my father's. Uh, a cousin had a confectionery there, which was sort of a, basically a soda shop. Um, after um, Guy Mullendor, or Garland Mullendor had that, then um, Joan Heinley, Smokey, 
Smokey Heinley had her hangout for the local kids. I was never really old enough, and I, I don't think you being younger probably ever made it to Smokey's either, but it was a place to go to get, I suppose, hamburgers and pop and ice cream and just hang out and be cool. Yeah. The Gamble store in Western Auto was next to that, and um, going back west. Um, the Schultz building took up so much of that block that there were several stores across the street from it. So what I remember were, was the Western Auto Store and then um, Squires Jewelers had their new store um, next to Dew's Restaurant on the corner. So Uptown Columbia City, we had Cle uh, Cleland's Restaurant, Dew's. Um, the Nook was actually down by the bank uh -huh. when we were young kids. But then they moved up to the location yeah, there. Yes. yes. So um, that is that side of the the street. But um, and I'm probably taking way too much time going over no, each you're little doing store. Just fine. <laughs> but it seems to me there was a restaurant called Mullendorf's. Yes, there was. Just south of the courthouse. <laughs> yes, indeed. And Dad and Mom, um, after Daddy retired from being the, the administrator of Whitley County Memorial Hospital, um, he had held um, a broker's license as a real estate agent for years. And of course we know a broker is someone who can close a deal on a, on a real estate sale. So for um, a while after being the administrator of the hospital, um, he did have in the Grant Building, um, a real estate office, um, and tax preparing. He was also certified to do taxes for people, whether it was business or residential. So um, he enjoyed that for several years, but then in doing those taxes um, and the books for um, Mr. and Mrs. Ewing, who owned a restaurant on South Main Street, um, they decided they were done with that part of their life, and my mother said, you know, why not consider a restaurant? And so Daddy, being a great cook, and having two children who were still in school, um, because he was 43 when I was born and 46 for my brother, um, he needed to really think about the fact that having a little bit of a, a an income for several mm -hmm. years before retirement was a really good idea. So uh, in the late um, 60s, early 70s, mom and dad bought the restaurant and it became Mullendore's Roasted Chicken. And now I am really hungry. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting that way, yeah. It was, it was a we great... We would run from Blue Bell all the way down to Mullendore's at lunchtime and snarf up food and run all the way back to <laughs> this is This is after high school? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. They were open. They were open from 11 in the morning until 8 o'clock when they first, in the evening, when they first um, had the restaurant. Later on, um, they didn't do the earlier morning hours it was more uh, afternoon and evening mm -hmm. so from four four o'clock to eight o'clock or so so it was more of a not a supper club because there was no alcoholic beverages <laughs> but but yes the um the um the workers is that the word i want um the employed of columbia city Truly appreciated a good restaurant, mm -hmm. good food, always hot, um, <laughs> fairly priced, in and out. Daddy was, um, Daddy was just great at whatever he did, um, and the restaurant was a wonderful place where people could have um, really, really good food. It wasn't like Dick and Sarah Stallhut's um, Thirty Club. That was truly a supper club. Right with drinks and, and more that atmosphere, but uh, Daddy's, Daddy's Roasted Chicken um, 
the, the food, the fare, it was good, wholesome, delicious, well portioned. You didn't ever go right. away hungry. And often you went away way full because as a young girl <laughs> working at the restaurant, there was the opportunity to um, serve someone a four piece chicken dinner with salad and potatoes and bread. And then I would very sweetly say, and wouldn't you love a piece of apple pie with ice cream? There was more than one <laughs> wife who probably turned to her husband to say, and you'll never ever wear your dress suit again because you <laughs> Because it's not gonna button. Because it's not gonna button. <laughs> because you know, the, the pieces of pie were just a wonderful size and Oh and your mother was such a wonderful I mean she she didn't tolerate anything from little kids. She would come out with her spoon and just on their head and say, That's enough. And by golly, that was enough. <laughs> <laughs> it was, um, she could elicit good behavior. It's true. Um, and they always loved her. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so that was Mullendore's. Um, anything else that stands out in your mind as particularly, <gasps> it's not there anymore. Oh, completely. Walk with me, would you please? Um, down Van Buren Street, we're now in the, we're on the 100 block of West Van Buren Street. So we are me immediately across from the courthouse. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is in the pre, um, it's in the pre-gazebo day. Uh, there's, there's that wonderful pine tree, spruce mm -hmm. tree that always held the Christmas lights because Santa's cottage was always there. But, um, Across the street, uh, in the business section, there was, um, on the corner, in my memory, um, on that north, sorry, I have to really stop and think my directions get, on the northeast corner, uh, what is now uh, a computer store, mm -hmm. um, as a very young girl, that was Williams Grocery. Oh, really? Yes. It was Williams Grocery, and then they built their new building in the area that is now the oh, Star Financial right. drive through Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Yes, that was Williams Food Mart, and that was that was such a cool store. They had electric doors. Wow. Mm -hmm. And it was, really, it was really a big store. When Yance's closed, it was only an additional for Grandma and I to walk. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. It was it was just that little bit more to go. But uh, Williams Mike Williams grocery store, it was it was so cool. It was so state of the art. We'd gone from the little corner grocery to now this is a supermarket. And it was very cool. And he had printed sacks with Williams on it. And mm -hmm. so I just thought that was great. <laughs> but after after um Williams Grocery, uh, it was Don's Hobby Shop. And if you yeah. wanted to do an airplane or you wanted to put together a boat or a car or anything, if you wanted um, a balsa wood mm -hmm. airplane to put together, you went to that little hobby shop. It was cool. Um, you didn't always find model horses to put together, <laughs> but I did once, and I thought that was really, really neat. He probably did it just for you. I think so. <laughs> Next to the hobby shop was, um, for a while, a Walgreens pharmacy. And then um, next to it was Al Rush's style shop. Now there's where Mommy went for the really cool, expensive clothes. <laughs> um, Al Rush ran it. His mother, Sadie, had the shop before. Um, he grew up. Uh, it was not uncommon for um, the sons of city fathers and mothers to become part of the family business. Sure. Just as Bud Strauss, um, Edgar Strauss Jr., became part of the Strauss um, business, Al Rush became part of the style shop business, and that was a great store. 
I knew that when I started buying my own clothes and I went there, I could find very, very cool grown-up things. <laughs> so we had the style shop there. Um, then Tagmeyer's Hardware was downtown. And they had a soda fountain. And they had a <laughs> soda fountain. That was so neat when Jim Tagmeyer put the soda fountain in and he went to the back. Um, you know, originally when we were kids, it was only half the, half of that building. And then uh, of, of the space that it was before they moved to the new store north of town again. Um, so there wasn't a soda fountain, but he put in, oh my goodness, it was the thrill of every young homemaker, I'm sure, but the, the gift house and the um, pots and pans mm -hmm. world <laughs> <laughs> opened up that door and in came this wonderful, um, opened up the wall and in came the second side of Tagmeyer's yeah. effectively making it twice as large and at the back was indeed the soda fountain and what a great memory that was and uh, you could count on seeing a lot of the, the local mm -hmm. regulars there they would have their own particular favorite stool <laughs> what a great memory yes indeed I don't know if I had anything that was a favorite just Ice cream in general. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> in general. Next to Tagmeyer's was Johnson's Menswear. It later became um, Treats Squire oh, Shop. Yeah. And I know that that was a very cool place for the really cool guys because when Treats, and they were originally based in Plymouth, Indiana. So um, they opened up a shop in Columbia City. And Jerry, um, it was Jerry's menswear after it was treats, but I know that um, the young man I was dating in high school, when it was time for a new suit, went there and bought the most amazing polyester <laughs> blue plaid suit, and he, by golly, he bought the one that was in green plaid along with it. Had two pairs of pants. I married the guy. Not because of the suits. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, he also bought a, a green suede um, snap button car coat. Oh, cool. <laughs> and the wide ties. But yes, it was it was a very cool store. When it was Johnson's menswear, it was on par with Strauss's. You know, very um, run by a very respectable mm. kind of. Um, proper gentleman, you know, not that right, subsequently sure. it was improper, but okay. Now we've crossed the alley. Walk quickly because that was a bar. <gasps> it was Rhodes Brothers. <laughs> and I never once as a child ever did anything but look at the step up with the little tiny um, ceramic black and white tiles because, you know, people went there and got drunk. <laughs> gas, gas. It has since become two really wonderful restaurants. It was the Columbia. It was remodeled, refurbished, and became a wonderful restaurant. And now is Northside Grill was still a wonderful uh, bunch of people working there and great food. Next to, um, next to Rhodes Brothers Bar was the other women's store, the, the Smart Shop. And that was filled with lots and lots of clothing racks. And you could go in and, and get, um, again, younger, not as matronly clothes. Um, to the east of Roma's Smart Shop was Wyke's Shoe Store, where you would go for your black and white or black patent leather shoes for Easter. Definitely um, catering to the older, staid part of the shoe-wearing public. Reed's Shoe Store, um, they were younger, mm -hmm. a younger couple running that store. So Mr. and Mrs. Reed always had really cool shoes that appealed to teens. Okay, then we have the tiny little um, restaurant, just that little narrow strip and that was where the nook originally was. 
and next to it, uh, and that was Howard and Mimi Huary, a wonderful couple. Gosh, love them so much. Uh, definitely another no-nonsense kind of lady. Yes. I remember once trying to leave a nickel tip, and she said, she pushed it back at me, she says, what do you think that's for? She was very, very much not into nickel tips. <laughs> Maybe she wanted more, I don't know. But then next to the nook was Columbia Theater. And that was just the most amazing, awesome building. And it looked like it would hold so much promise, but all of a sudden, for no reason that my little mind could understand, they decided to tear it down because Citizens State Bank was going to have a new building, and it was Citizens National Bank. Hmm. So we need to cross the street across from the theater to the opposite corner, and that was where Citizens State Bank was. And as a child, I remember that um, one of the men who ran Citizens State Bank was um, Mr. Don Alberti. And he was, he was also a great athlete like my father and golfed at Cricket Lake and at other tournaments together. So um, the Citizen State Bank, um, when it was torn down, it became nothing. It became a parking lot for mm -hmm. Citizens National Bank. They did save the smallest amount of Citizen State Bank. So when you walk into today, Star Financial Bank, as it's now called, and you walk up to a teller's window. The marble that is there at the teller's windows is from the old bank. Really? So, it is such a small bit. Yeah. Yes. Um, when you when you go down um, when you go down now we're at Main Street. When we go down south on Main Street. Um, Two blocks down from Van Buren, we still see the bowling alley. It used to be Cook's Lanes. Um, but things have changed. Where we now see the, the county jail, that was Buchanan's autom automotive, um, uh, the Ford, it was the old Ford home, that was what it was called, <laughs> uh, and this was even before Buchanan's, but it was, um, it was there um, across the street from that car dealership was Gene Reed Pontiac, he'd been there since um, the early 50s as I'm told and remember. Um, north of Gene Reed on the east side of Main Street was the hatchery. There was a hatchery there. Um, Chick Sprunger's hatchery, Myron Sprunger's hatchery. Um, in my young child's mind's eye, I remember it as being a pet store and an aquarium. <laughs> and I bought guppies there, which became part of some very fantastic scientific experiments, my brother and I. I think we were trying to populate um, the Pacific Ocean with guppies. My mother said, I think you need to be able to tell the boy guppies from the girl the guppies and we need to cut back because it was getting, <laughs> it was, there were too many guppies at our house. Anyway, um, but Murphy's Jewelers is still there and I'm glad, I mean, it's one of the few, if not one of the only family run businesses. Right. Um, of course, in the late 50s, I don't know that it was actually Murphy's, it may have been Osborne's, but with a little research we might find out that the mm -hmm. Murphy's and the Osborne's were related. Maybe it was an aunt or a grandmother, I don't know, but I think that's where Osborne's was. Um, the Elks, um, how do you call them, the Elks Lodge? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Benevolent Order of Elks has always been on that block. Um, it had a shiny black oh, facade, and I always thought it was so yes, elegant. It did. 
Um, Rusty Herder became uh, a stonemason and re-faced re, um, that back in the late 70s, I think. Yeah, they, but it was it always looked so elegant. Um, yeah, the elves always wanted to be a little bit the more black posh. The silver, it was always just mm -hmm. really... Mm. It looked very elegant. I had forgotten that. <laughs> and the and the um, well healed, well connected part of the community belonged really yeah. to the Elks. Yeah. Um, I know that there was always an Eagles Lodge, mm -hmm. and um, you know they were civic minded organizations, but the Elks had more clout. They were better known, and yeah. um, so and Kaiser's Restaurant was there, and. Um, that was that was probably a favorite place, as I said before, for Daddy and I to go for lunch. They served drumettes. I mean, now we know them as just that big part of the of a chicken wing. Here's my chicken wing. <laughs> You're very effective visual aid. Thank you very much. Um, it had bones in it. Believe it or not, we served chicken with bones. Yeah. Yeah, and um, you could have these little drumettes at lunch. And I remember going back after having dinner there, lunch with Daddy, and telling my second grade teacher that I ate six chicken legs for lunch. Well, they were just this big, but to me it was a wonderful thing, and she thought that was just too much. You know, you're yeah. eating too much for lunch. Now you're going to take a nap. Yes. <laughs> but, oh, um, and Mosher's Barber Shop was on that street on the corner, and it still is functioning as a barber shop mm -hmm. to this day. That's where my dad went. <laughs> my daddy always went to Bowers, but maybe it's because he got a piece of bubble gum. I well, could be. Trip. I don't know. <laughs> Blackjack or clove gum or tea berry. I don't know. Um, but that was that was what I remembered uh, of of the downtown mm -hmm. area. The courthouse. The courthouse was built. I always remember this in, or begun in 1888. That was the year my father's mother was born. And City Hall, I believe, was built along about the time my father was born in the early teens, the old original mm -hmm. City Hall. And as a, as a young grade schooler, early junior high, the city offered Saturday movies upstairs in City Hall, and you could buy, you could go in for a dime, and a sack of popcorn was a nickel, and watch movies. Cool. And that was cool. And I would bet that Susie Duncan Sexton might have memories of that too. Very well, might. yes. Very well, might. Um, the doctor's office of Jules Herder was on the corner of um, Chauncey Street and Market Street, across from the courthouse. Um, next to City Hall, and um, he was he was a, a great physician. He was the doctor who successfully helped my arrival. <laughs> <laughs> um, being a cesarean baby, you know, it's nice that there was a doctor who could do that successfully. So yeah. my parents my parents became parents because of Dr. Herder, who had been in the army. In World War II, along with my father, so um, so many families were so connected, and with Daddy being the administrator of the hospital, our life was filled with so many people in the medical profession. Mm -hmm. um, but you knew one another because of that closeness of everyone needing to be in downtown, not spread out as we are today with fewer stores and mega stores as we have. Um, there was so much more interpersonal relations and you knew people and you were expected to be on your best behavior because someone who knew mom and dad would probably tell them if they saw you misbehaving. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, as you went on out of town going east, um, some of the landmarks that I remember that aren't there, uh, Demoni's funeral home. Oh, I watched it burn. Yeah, and that was that was really something. Um, old family-owned business, um, back to horse and 
Right. Horse drawn hearse days. Right. So um, Bob Demoni, whose name is is still associated with Demoni Grimes today, a very a very fine establishment, um, was married to my mother's cousin. So it was interesting, you know. Um, our family, when funerals would come, we were there having family, in essence, take care of us. But on my father's side of the family, his mother was a Smith, so wow. the Smith's funeral home was there too. And I always wondered, you know, is there a conflict of interest where we go? <laughs> you can't divide yourself and go nah. one and the other. <laughs> but, um, and uh, we're sitting here today talking together in the beautiful new Peabody Library, but I so remember fondly um, hours and hours spent at the old Peabody Library um, sitting, no doubt I did science projects sitting at this table. I almost feel myself working <laughs> on homework at this table because this building, this room in particular has some of the old furniture of the Peabody library downtown. So um, that was that was on the corner of um, Jackson and Main Street and when you then walked on down that street of course um, here was the library across the street was Williams Grocery and the Post and Mail, our newspaper office was there and you could count on seeing the wonderful Hester Adams there. Oh my gracious, what a what a woman! And she ran a great paper. Um, across the street was the Presbyterian Church. The building is there, but the congregation no longer is there. The church is closed down. And sandwiched in between the alley and the Presbyterian Church was our veterinary office in a little red paint, painted red <laughs> carriage shed where ostensibly maybe um, the preacher of the Presbyterian Church parked his horse, I don't know. <laughs> but until uh, Dr. Waterfall and Dr. Ritchie moved north on State Road 9 to build uh, their, or have their office there, that was, um, I guess it was just Dr. Ritchie, wasn't it? He, Dr. Waterfall had retired, so yeah. Dr. Scott and Dr. Ritchie moved behind the new Kroger store, not yeah. the new Kroger store, but the new, new Kroger store. <laughs> yeah. Oh, go there. <laughs> Work with me. Thank you, Debbie. <laughs> so, um, y you could, you could stop and, and say hello to, you know, Dr. Coble then and young Dr. Waterfall. Um, the Methodist church was still meeting, um, across from the post office, on uh, north of the post office. They are now out on Forest Parkway. Yeah. So um, the, city's, the city's churches r rang out their bells. I mean, it was, um, it was a community where you were expected on Sundays to be in church. And the Evangelical United Brethren were uh, just catty corner from the courthouse on Market Street. Um, Grace Lutheran Church had their old building, um, which had the historic steeple, which had its own little fire back in the day. And, um, you know, if you were able to go up into the courthouse's um, bell tower, clock tower and look out, you would see things that the facades haven't changed that much, but what's inside them is is gone, as opposed to when you look at us today, our, our insides are pretty much the same, but <laughs> some of our outsides have changed a little bit. Um, so, so, at any way, what a great community. It's a privilege to be here. Well, I really appreciate you being here today. Thanks so much. And we've had a good time. We have had an excellent time. Alrighty, thank you. You're welcome.